Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Lady Nika, and with episode five and six of the Netflix series entitled Monster, which is the Jeffrey Dahmer story. Before I begin, I want to apologize to each and every one of you that I was unable, due to a medical situation, to give you episode five and six in a live review as I had been doing the rest of them. So in lieu of having you have to wait until Monday, I'm going to do five and six and load it up as a premiere. And then on Monday, we will pick up the live reviews. Thank you for your prayers and your patience. So with that being said, we're going to jump right on in because this is a lot. And I want to tell you guys the story at, from my point of view, okay? So, again, this is Monsters, the Jeffrey Dahmer store, story, episode five and six. Episode five is entitled Blood on Their Hands. And we pick up in Milwaukee on in 1987. At this point, Jeffrey is now working at a chocolate factory, and child, he still drinking. In fact, he is drinking that old nasty Budweiser, the king of beers, even down to the break room at the job with his cheese sandwich, okay? he uh, Here comes a more weirdness that is Jeffrey Dahmer. We see during his break at the chocolate factory where he is drinking his beer and munching on his cheese sandwich that Jeffrey has a newspaper. And he looks at that newspaper and runs across an obituary, y'all, in the newspaper. Now, mind you, he don't know this young man from Adam. No, he don't. But he feels connected enough to go to this young man's funeral. Now, if that ain't weird enough, because you do have your weeping wonders of the world. They will go to people's funerals. And I know folks personally that just seems to get off on funerals. I, I'm not saying they get off sexually. But for some reason, they love to have old nasty funeral to go to. Okay? But the difference between those people and this individual is that later on, he tries to literally dig up the body from the grave. Yes, he did. Now, why, I don't know. He don't know either, okay? He don't know either. And luckily, it was around the time that the ground was so solid that it was difficult for him to dig this child's body up, so he had to abort mission. He talking about he just wanted to lay with him. See, <laughs> I see why the black detective was getting so heated when he was interrogating him. Because at one point, Jeffrey is basically doing a confession during this series. And he's recalling everything that he had done. Now, I don't know why he decided that he wanted to pick up the remains. He wanted to literally uh, dig up the remains of this young man named Donald Daniel who had died. And... It's just stuff like that that made me understand why there's so much anger toward the Jeffrey Dahmer, even though he no longer lives in the real world. He is now a part of the afterlife floating somewhere, hopefully close to hell. But anyway, I get it now. Now, he's being interviewed by these two detectives, one white, one black, right? The white detective wanted to know, uh, wanted Jeffrey to help them understand why in the world would he want to dig up a body? And the black detective said, control. And oddly enough, Jeffrey agreed. He felt that everybody in his life had told him what to do, from his father to his grandmother to his bosses. So when it came to these victims or non-victims, he felt as if he was going to be able to have some form of control upon them. Now, during his interrogation process, they took him back to Stephen Hicks, okay? Jeffrey didn't even remember that man's name. Now, for those of you who don't know the story, there is two Steves that he killed. There's a, 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 T, a Steve, 
uh, Toonami, and that's the dancer from the hotel that he killed when he was under the influence. But it, and there's also Stephen Hicks, that was the hitchhiker, right? Jeffrey didn't even remember their names, okay? He was referring to the man as the hitchhiker, okay? He was actually surprised that he had killed two Stevens. I said, ooh. But according to Jeffrey, that was an accident. Then the detective mentioned Steve Toonami, which is the dancer, and he said from the hotel, and he said that was an accident as well, and went on to say he even drugged himself on accident with that guy. He said after uh, the second Stephen at the hotel, his drinking got more habitual, and he started to feel more and more alone. While, then while still living with Grandmama, he decided to go back down to the bar, pick up someone, and to show the level of disrespect that he has truly got for his grandmother, he was bringing these people back to her house. Just no respect at all. He was bringing uh, the men that he met in there, you know, spiking their drinks, uh, dragging them to the cellar and strangling them because he didn't want them to suffer. Yes, this is truly the mind of a maniac. One guy, we saw him on top of a uh, nude, and that man was nude as well. And he had just strangled the man to death and got aroused and started making out with the corpse. He was truly a demon, a very sick and methodical demon. He admitted to killing three men at his grandmama's house, right? One black, one Chicano, and one African uh, American Indian. He said it just depended if he saw all the men as beautiful. And the black cop said, no, 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 no. He ain't buying it. He said to Jeffrey that you purposefully moved into a black community in an apartment. Jeffrey tried to say that was what he could afford. And the man said, absolutely not. He called Bull. He told him you moved to an area that was under patrolled and underserved. You, sir, knew what you were doing. And I agree because he wasn't doing all that in no in it when he was over there with uh his parents in suburban white America. He felt like it was easier to get away in the black community. Anyway, Jeffrey goes on to say that he would panic after the killings. He worried he, he uh he worried would his grandma come downstairs, but he wasn't too worried about that because she didn't really care too much about going down the stairwells to that uh fruit cellar. So he felt a little comfort in that. Then Grandmama did start shaking his nerve because Grandmama noticed the smell in her house and asked him about it. That's when he started to triple bag the bodies and throw them in the trash. And, you know, that that took away the smell some in the house. He called the mis the dismembering of bodies experiments. Mm -hmm. Chopping these people's bodies up was an experiment to him. He was um he was down he was down there soaking some of the body parts in acid. Some of the body parts he would boil until the flesh came off. And he said, you know, his compulsion just kind of took over him after some time. No, baby, that was a demon. But okay, Jeffrey. He had no chill or, e or even an inkling of desire to stop doing what he was doing. In the middle of that, fool telling these detectives all this gruesome shit, he asked for the electric chair. You think I can get the electric chair? I was thoroughly, thoroughly enraged because honestly, the way he did die was more humane. Even the way he died, the way he was murdered in the prison was more humane than what he showed toward the 17 people he ended their life. This is a psychopathic demon and I think that we are a whole lot better in this world without Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer never had heard voices according to him. According to him, he wasn't insane. Now, I'm going to catch the replay so of this premiere. So I want to know in the chat, 
If you feel that Jeffrey Dahmer was insane, please put a one in the chat. And if you feel that he was not insane, put a two in the chat. I'm just curious because this sounds like insanity to me. Okay. He said he got it easy. He got it easier, and that's why he kept it. kept It got easier for him to do, it, and that's why he kept doing it. Mm-hmm. He sure his grandmama suspected something, but said that she was possibly staying quiet out of fear of finding the answer. She saw he brought guys home and didn't want to accept his lifestyle. She didn't want to acknowledge it, but those smells did come back again, and he claimed to her that it was his taxidermy stuff. He even lied once and said it was a dead raccoon under the house, and he couldn't reach it, but told her the smell would eventually die down, and he ain't insane. Okay. Now, what she wasn't accepting was the devil worshiping altar that she found in his closet oh she wasn't feeling that baby she got on her hotline bling and called his father lionel over there and he shows up after months and he goes down to the cellar scolding jeffrey for not cleaning up so-called blood properly and told him his grandmother not feeling that altar upstairs he might want to get rid of that he also notices the type of utensils jeffrey is using you use that big saw for a roadkill? Mm-hmm. Jeffrey had a smooth way of talking his way out of stuff, and it really helps when your parent don't really give a damn or they're afraid of that truth, okay? Now, he promised he would stop, and he did for months. Then he started to feel the fear. He just knew he'd get caught at that point that that didn't hold him from doing it any further because he started again and according to him he tried to stop and we're supposed to believe that he wasn't insane okay he is crazy as cat pee okay nuttier than a squirrel crazy as a sprayed cockroach do you hear me he is crazy as a runover cat Crazier than an outhouse fly. Crazy as a Betsy bug. I think at this point, y'all get my point, that the man is off his damn rocker. Okay, we settled on that point. Now, he told of a time, according to him, that he really screwed up. And it went like this. He met this guy. There's this black guy. He see him at the club, and when the guy attempts to leave, he finds that his battery has uh, died on him, right? And Jeffrey appeared out, out of nowhere, just like old Nasty Piece of Thief in the night, offering to jump the man's car because the battery died. Now, he wants the dude to walk around the corner to his grandma's house to get his car and come back. And dude gave him, you know, give him a boost. Old boy was thinking, well, shit. Should I decline the offer or be afraid? And ended up agreeing to it. But he was thinking logically at first. He said, well, I'll just wait for you to come back here. But Jeffrey wanted him to accompany him to Grandma Mall's house. In fact, he offered to take a taxi because the neighborhood that they were in was not very, mm, let's just say, safe. Run was that guy's name, okay? And, you know. He ends up walking with Jeffrey up to Grandma's house. Once inside, Jeffrey claims to be looking for his keys. And then they started trying to, you know, get the boy down to the cellar, offering him drinks and stuff. And Ron was like, no, I only came because you offered the key. Help me. Besides, I got to work in the morning. So he gets Ron to accept a drink, but not an alcoholic drink. He going to take a little cup of Sanka coffee, Okay. Grandmama woke up and asked who was there, and Jeffrey said a friend. Well, then Grandmama, uh, at least he thought, was settled again. And Ron made it clear constantly that they not going to sleep together. And Jeffrey said, we'll see. And at that point, Ron got mad and said, you know what? Fuck you. I'm out of here. And got up to leave. And then he realized his vision is blurry because he didn't sip that sink of coffee and Jeffrey had spiked the coffee. Ron is now feeling the effects of the 
drugged coffee. Yes, he is. He's asking if Ron is okay, and Ron is, is like he's lightheaded, and he knows Jeff was spiked the coffee at that point. But guess what? Grandma Mom ain't settled in back in bed, and she starts yelling from upstairs that Jeffrey Carpenter needs to go home because it's too late. And he yelling at her that that's what they finna do. They finna leave. Meanwhile, he done pushed a damn near comatose Ron down on a chair and leaning over him. Ain't no way my grandma, ma, my dear, as we call them in the black households, or big mama, but mine was my dear, you know, would have allowed my octave of my voice to ever elevate that high in her house. <laughs> Baby, she'd have slid, not walked down that damn back, uh, them stairs. My grandma would have sat on that banister and slid down. And, oh, bitch, when she reached that downstairs area, whether she got her gun or it's an item to swing it to, she going to make sure she made contact with you to let you know what you said wasn't right. We used to call my grandma on the left hand bandit. Baby, everything she put in that left hand and swung it, baby, she hit it with precision, precision with that, that damn left hand. My grandma was a beast with the left hand bandit. Long live the left hand bandit. Now, I'm talking about the real Medeas, y'all. Not these new age Medeas that, you know, end up sometime fucking their daughters or her grand or their granddaughters, man. No, I'm talking about the real Medeas, the ones that don't party with them, baby. I'm talking about the real ones that wore age appropriate clothes and wigs and loved the Lord but would fuck you up all at the same damn time. I'm talking about her. Mm -hmm. Child, she had a little um a little black in, in, in you know, she had a little <laughs> grandma was a little racist, if you ask me, okay? Because she came down them stairs and she said, I didn't know you had black friends. And Jeff was just about to strangle Ron, okay? But she came downstairs and basically caught him in the act. And he told her, Grandma, this not 1920 anymore. And she notices Ron not doing too well. And she asked, uh, do he need to go to the hospital? But Jeff said, no, he's just a little wasted. And then she asked, what was he drinking? And asked Jeff, was he drinking? Of course, he's going to lie and say no. Now, your homeboy drunk as hell and can't hardly move. Boy, you up to no good yet. She said, ain't no stranger dying in her house. So Jeff asked, could he just sleep it off? And she said, no. She said something wasn't right. And she headed to the phone to call his dad. Of course, he stopped that immediately. And told her that the boy just drunk too much and he needed to sleep it off. So she went and got a blanket. She said she's going to cover Ron up. And she's staying down there until he wakes up. Despite Jeffrey trying to make her go back to bed. Grandma Ma stood firm and told him, hell no, she ain't going back to bed. She's staying down there. And if the boy needs medical attention, she is going to take him to the hospital. He cursed at her again. I said, Grandma Ma, you a different breed, baby. Because you let this boy sit up in your house where you pay the bills and curse you twice anyway. Way, uh, she says she's gonna watch him, mm -hmm. and she definitely will be telling his father about this. All he could say was, If you're so worried, why not call an ambulance? And then he gonna smirk off at her. I already know why, trying to say because it's a black boy in that house, that's why she won't call. The dude run wakes up though, still not all together there, but she and Jeffrey take him to the bus stop. They put him on a bus, asked the driver to make sure he get off safely, gave a bogus ass street as where to where Ron supposedly was lives on. And now I know I you know <laughs> that, that was crazy. I don't grandma saved Ron's life, to be honest with you. Even though when he woke up the next morning, he still wasn't in his right state of mind to actually be able to speak and explain what had happened to him. She saved his life. And Ron stayed on that bus until they reached the end of the line. The bus driver woke him up. He's still out of it for the most part. He almost got hit by a truck, but ended up wandering into a field where he collapsed. And when he collapsed, when he woke up again, he was in a hospital. 
looking at a nurse that's telling him that he od and he said he don't do drugs and remember the dude from last night he remembered he drugged him and was up to no good ron then once he recovers goes to the police and they tell he tells them his story now he's telling them oh boy it's danger even though in this situation, he's lost his watch and two hundred dollars is missing. He ain't worried about that. He wants something done before Jeffrey is allowed to do something to someone else. He remembered where Grandma Ma stayed, and uh, the cop went to see Jeffrey and asked questions. Jeffrey lied, talking about the dude was drunk, that his car battery died, so he offered him to come back to the house, drink some coffee, sleep it off. And he tried to sound like he was being a good Samaritan, and it was really the opposite. The cop asked if he looked around, would he find any tranquilizers or whatnot? He said no, he wouldn't even know what it looked like. He denied stealing Ron's money and watch, and the sad part about it all, Grandmama backed him. Later, the police tell Ron that although Jeffrey is odd, he denied it all and his grandmother backed his story. The cop made an assumption that Ron had been arrested before to say that just because a person has an arrest record doesn't make them a criminal. And that's when Ron busts his entire face by telling him, I ain't never been arrested. Ron says, so let me get this right. You're going to take the word of a white man with a criminal record over a word of a black man with no criminal record? He said, this man tried to kill me and there's nothing you can do about it? And Johnny Lawman said, without evidence, we can't do anything about it. Ron asked what was Jeff arrested for, and of course the cop wouldn't tell him. And it angered him, but he respectfully thanked the detective for his time, and he left. Okay. Later on that evening, Jeffrey was about to do it again. Ron saw him with a dude, a black guy that was obviously uh, inebriated, about to get into a cab, but he stopped him. He told the dude that Jeffrey was with, that Jeffrey was going to kill him, that he was going to spike his drink. Jeffrey was about... Uh, he was about to do it again. Old boy ran off, and Ron and Jeffrey stood eye to eye. Then Jeffrey backed off and got in the cab alone. I don't know whoever that young man was that was about to get in that cab with Jeffrey, but Ron saved his night life that night because he was about to do it again. Another night, a young man leaves out of his grandma's house and she wakes up to see Jeffrey trying to offer him money to come back. It wasn't no young man. It was, in fact, a young boy, okay? A young boy. He was about to go after that young boy and try to get him back into that house, but the grandma hit that window to let him know she see him, so he couldn't harm that one either. The boy ended up stumbling to his home totally under the influence. His family has to end up calling the ambulance for him. So the next thing we saw was Jeffrey was back at work at the chocolate factory stirring sugar into the chocolate when the police came and arrested his ass. Next time we see him, he's in a court answering to charges of sexual assault in the second degree to which he pled no contest and was sentenced to one year in the custody of the Milwaukee County House of Corrections. Now, this is the part of the story that kind of pissed me off. The judge said Jeffrey reminded him of his grandson who had issues as well. But now the grandson has a successful car wash. He said Jeffrey was not the kind of guy who belonged in the correction system. He said Jeffrey deserved a second chance and today was his lucky day because he was going to give it to him. And I said, what the fuck? Even the court reporter was shocked and stopped typing. So with his victim, his dad, and the whole judicial system for Milwaukee looking on, this, and, and it's in the transcripts if you go back and look this up. Do you know that he gave him, he told him he's going he's gonna to put him in a work release program 
40 hours per week. After work, he reports right back to jail, and he will leave out the exact nature of his misconduct to his employee so he can keep his job. He asked Jeffrey if that sounded fair, and of course, Jeffrey said yes and thanked the judge. Now, just imagine how that young man he assaulted and his family was feeling in this courtroom, and all Lionel could do was just hold his head down because he knew this wasn't right, but of course, he's going to be for his son, right? That judgment was not fair at all, not at all. This seemed like nobody wanted to do right by what these victims until he had denied that it was 17 deep. Child, let me go on, uh, keep going. Later, Jeffrey and Lionel are in the car headed to Grandma Ma's for one final uh, family dinner before he has to go and start his sentence. And Lionel lets him know what he gets out of jail. He will have to find a place of his own. The family is at their wit's end. At the dinner, Shari lets Jeffrey know Grandma Ma paid his 25k bill, and I believe that's what it was, and said that he gonna have to pay her back. Jeffrey said okay, and proceeded to lie about it all being a setup, and that he was only trying to do some photography. Grandma Ma walked off, cause she over, she didn't heard enough of his lies. He gonna say no more hobbies for him. And his dad was like enough. Cause nobody wants to hear the lies. Yet they accept it for years. Now they tired of it. Oh, child. And as they sit at the table. Saying little to nothing. Lionel asks for the box that his grandmother had uh, given him. With the pictures and ribbons Lionel had won as a child. You know, the family heirloom that we talked about in the other episode. The dad wants the box and Jeffrey, uh, he asked Jeffrey to go get it. He said no at first sight that she gave it to him. But his dad, Lionel, insists to get your ass up. Go get that damn box. Jeffrey got up and Lionel did as well. And Jeffrey asked if he was going to follow him. And Lionel said, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So they go upstairs in Jeffrey's room, and he takes the box out of the closet and claims he lost the key, but Dad is not convinced. So he asks him what's in there, and Jeff kept saying stuff. So Lana gets aggravated and goes to get something to open the box up. Of course, that's giving Jeffrey time to take the head that he had housed inside of that box out. So when he comes back, Jeff unlocks, uh, had to unlock the bedroom door. He unlocks the bedroom door, and inside, Orlando orders him, because he done found the key miraculously, to open up the thing, open up the box, and it ain't got nothing but magazines in it. But if he would have looked over on the side of that bed, he'd have saw that head that he had down there. I said, just crazy. Later on, on the drive home, Shari and Lionel are talking. And she's telling him it's okay to be upset. Any parent would be knowing that their son is going to prison the next morning. Lionel wonders, what did he do this to him? He wonders, should he have just stayed in his marriage? Perhaps did more like the taxidermy stuff with him? He said he should have pushed harder to find out what was going on. Excuse me, this is where I have to pause. Uh, you should have done more to find The boy was trying to tell you. When he right around the time he graduated from high school, that something wasn't right. You didn't want to listen, and you pushed him into Ohio State University, where he ended up getting kicked out anyway, and you pushed him into the military. So, sir, save it, okay? He admits that what I said was true, and he knew something was wrong with the boy. And, but the truth can be painful and very uncomfortable. Y'all, as much as I wanted to care about Lionel's feeling as he began to weep, I felt nothing. Mm-mm. There were red flags. But all of them in that family ignored it. The call from the dis from him being discharged uh uh from the military. The time you asked what was his what was that mannequin doing in his bed over at Grandma Ma's? When you asked uh what was he doing at the state fair, why he molested that boy, you accepted all the bullshit excuses. And you know, this sir is only the beginning of the nightmare that you made. Now 
Jeffrey takes a lot of responsibility for it as well when he became adult. But when he was first starting to go left, his parents had a responsibility and they absolutely ignored it. Too busy consumed with their own affairs, okay? He had a chance to stop this before it began. You know, him and the hypochondriac ass ex-wife named Joyce. Girl, get the hell out of here. In the episode, he mentions the, the look on the father's face and eyes that, you know, <laughs> in this episode, he talked about the look on the gentleman's face who Jeffrey's son uh, Jeffrey had assaulted his 14 or 13 year old son. That man stood in that courtroom because we got a chance to see the replay of what happened. Although this is an immigrant, this man stood up and he was able to say what he felt. Now, it's this judge with this nasty attitude that gave me a problem, but let's continue. That man said that Jeffrey Dahmer knew how old his son was because he asked him what school and what grade he was in. The man said that he, if his son wasn't so strong and athletic, Jeffrey would have killed him. And Lionel is sitting there replaying it in his head because he knows Jeffrey lied about the whole situation. He knows what Jeffrey's intentions were not so pure as it pertains to this boy. But he ain't saying that. Now, that judge was biased and disrespectful. Disrespectful as hell, claiming that he couldn't understand the man because of his dialect. <clears throat> Although his accent was was very heavy, he understood that man. He even went so far as to get the man to come up to a son to come up and translate. When the son came up, the man is saying that they are immigrants, but they work hard. They take jobs as they can. They don't have money for expensive lawyers. Then he said the family not eating or sleeping since this happened. And that insensitive ass judge was annoyed and just entered the man's handwritten letter into evidence, opposing to letting him speak. That man stared Lionel down in that courtroom as the judge rendered that pathetic, weak ass verdict. So Lionel pins a letter to the judge. We see him write the judge. Um, asking that Jeffrey be placed in a treatment center for alcoholics, alcoholics, and he stressed that it was a critical to his future that he receives this treatment. I said, child. Jeffrey entered jail where the inmates were awaiting him, calling him a child of uh, R word, not feeling him at all. But he survived that. One, little, one year later, Jeffrey is released, and Lionel picks him up. And from sight, he seems to have gotten better, but looks can always be deceiving, right? He was going to stay with Grandma Ma for one week only. He asked if Jeff received any counseling of any kind, and Jeff said no. So, deep down in his heart, Lionel know it's only a matter of time. Because he really thought that by writing that letter to that judge, that was going to shake something, move something, and get his son some help. But no. He sends Jeffrey to the car to go on and put his stuff in the car and sits in that hallway and damn near breaks down because he know that the monster that is inside his son will reemerge soon and he don't know who going to be on the receiving end of that. I said, child, what made you think that Jeffrey Dahmer was in it? But I guess because you thought you had, mm, girl, no. Lionel was uh, correct because we see Jeff has his apartment and he has led this black deaf young man to his apartment. So the terror is about to begin all over and his dad knew it was coming. Now, that brought us to the end of episode five. Now we're going to roll right on into episode six, and I'm going to tell you at this time, viewer discretion is advised. 
this is going to be a very heavy episode, but I'm going to give it the best that I possibly can in this review. Um, I don't know no other way to tell the story than this. I, I do, it, it's so sensitive. I can't even put any play play in it. So I'm going to tell it like it happened according to my perspective. Episode 6 is entitled Silenced. We go to what Milwaukee, 1960. A lady named Shirley gave birth to this beautiful little boy, and they called him Tony. Months later, Shirley learns that, you know, she takes her son to the doctor and learn, and she's complaining that he hasn't been responding normally, and she wants to see if he's okay. Well, apparently Tony was treated for pneumonia, and his OBGYN placed him on some antibiotics one in particular called Genotype. Uh, child, I think it's Genotonacian. Genotonacian. I don't know. I could be saying it wrong. But since it was, you know, learned that gen uh, genotomycin can cause hearing loss, that's what actually happened to baby Tony. Because of that antibiotic, Tony is now 100% deaf. And the doctors explained that there are resources available to help parents of kids who are like Tony, but he ain't going to never regain hearing. So it then takes us up to 1991. And Tony has grown up. He's functioning in the world as a deaf person. He signs well. He's made friends like himself. And he goes out to the clubs and the parties, but Tony ain't want to be, he don't want to be a one night stand for nobody. Yes, he is, you know, he does come from a loving and supportive family, but Tony wants more for his life. He wants to be in a real relationship, okay? He wants to be a model. He wants, his dreams are bigger than just being right there in this city, that little town with the family, right? Mm -hmm. He got some cool little friends. They bonded. But like I said, Tony wants some more. He wants to leave his hometown and go to Madison where there's a deaf school for the deaf. He wants to find true love, someone he can call his own. And despite the obstacles, Blay, uh, black, gay, and deaf, he believes he can find it and he wants to you know he's determined to find his way in his in this world he met this dude named manny in the club and once manny realized he was deaf his interest faded quickly and that was disappointing to tony very disappointing so later on he's at a pizza parlor with his homeboys Both, all three of them were um, deaf. I'm kind of, they all were deaf. Now, the white one talking about dating, the dating pool. And Tony, not a hit and quit it tight. He wants more and a career. Rico is the white one, as you can see on the screen, who is more loose, if you will, and doesn't really have any, any expectation. But regardless, he supports Tony's aspiration. Later, Tony telling his mom, um about his job at the assembly line not really being what he want but she tell him uh an honest paycheck is good to have as long as he keeps making god and her proud then the 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 young man with the hat on in the picture comes and knocks on tony's door and he tells them that their friend Rico, the white boy, was found murdered and they don't have any details as to what happened. And Tony took that really hard, extremely hard. But it also prompted him, it's time to start my journey of discovering what this life has to offer for me to pursue my dreams. Shirley is worried and don't want him to go uh, to Madison, but he's an adult and has to find his way. So she lets her son go off re to realize his dreams. When we see him get there, he goes to several black establishments looking for work and end up finding this job at the bottom half because he's able to communicate with his 
employer through sign because his employer's sister is deaf as well. And I was so happy when he finally found him a job because we saw him go to several places. And it was clear that they were saying no to him simply because of the fact that he was deaf. Either it was his skin color it was him being deaf. Tony was handsome. And he answered an ad for a modeling. And things seemed to be going well on the photo shoot. Then the photographer begins to try to hit on him. But see, he's not street booty. He wants more, you know. And he's sticking to that. So he comes home for a visit on the weekend to find out that his sister is having a little baby girl. And she wants to name the baby after him, which makes him very happy. Later on that evening, he goes to the club, and the devil was there admiring his dance moves. So Tony ends up talking to Jeffrey, letting him know, you know, he deaf. They end up dancing and having a good, good time. Jeffrey asks him to have another drink, and Tony agrees. Jeffrey orders the two whiskey and coats, and he contemplated spiking Tony drink, but he didn't. Toward the end of the night, Jeffrey tells him that he likes him a lot. But see, Tony wasn't street booty. He didn't go home with Jeffrey. They met up again at this spot and does, you know, like, they, they did meet up a couple of times. They do photo shoots afterwards. They go get a bite to eat. And they seem to be building a friendship. He seems to like Jeffrey. So far, he has remained somewhat normal. And, you know, it, it's been moments where you can tell that Jeffrey is fighting an urge of some sort, you know. But as of yet, he has not fallen for temptation. Shari and Lionel go to visit Jeffrey at his apartment. And it is very nice. It's very clean in there. And they kind of surprised. He has a small aquarium. He's keeping up with rather nicely he tells him he hasn't been drinking as much and definitely not drinking alone because that seems to start the psychosis he thanks his dad for sticking with him despite how difficult he's been he's gotten a promotion on his job and he's happy that's what he told his dad and his dad is happy to hear that hell he thinks that he was even overwhelmed Lionel was somewhat emotional because he thinks his boy is going to make it he mentioned that he has a friend, and you see him flash back into moments he spent with Tony, right? So it seems as if Jeffrey's life is starting to take a turn for the better, even though we see glimpses of him fighting that inner demon. He finally got Tony to come over and contemplating once again spiking his drink, but he didn't do it. Tony writes down, what, what should we do? So they start playing this weird ass game and that even didn't, you know, Tony didn't really understand that and me neither. Jeffrey showed a little aggravation, but Tony submitted and played the game and that led to them having their first kiss. And then they wake up the next morning and Tony has to go. And I said, oh my God. Jeffrey asked when did uh, he see him again and Tony said next week. Remember, he got to go back to school. Jeffrey goes into this psychosis and grabs a hammer about to bash Tony, but Tony said he would return for Jeffrey and for Jeffrey to trust him. And we saw him leave that apartment, okay? Jeffrey just standing there like he is starting to go into a place that ain't healthy for him to go into. Shirley, uh, Shirley is down at the police station at this point because we move for forward a minute and she's saying she hasn't seen her son in two days and that's not like her that's not like him and i get nervous because i'm like but we saw him leave out of his apartment what happened we see them placing missing person signs around town because the police is not moving to kind of help she organizes a community uh search efforts taking up donations to help with finding tony Jeffrey even took his snake ass down there and donated to them people, knowing what he knew at that point. Child, what happened was he went back to the apartment. 
after he had been granted an opportunity to leave, Tony forgot his ID and he went back to the apartment. And he was killed. He was killed. He bludgeoned him. After that, he's now drinking again. And he has a whole slew of people who he has taken their lives. IDs. And this fool is calling the family to tell them don't search for their loved ones and hang them. And that's when we really did see the full scene of what he did to Tony. He went back to that apartment. And Jeffrey Dahmer bludgeoned him with that hammer. Over at Tony's mama house, Let me put this picture back up. Okay. At Tony's mama house, Miss Shirley, she replaying her last conversation with Tony and how she warned him to be careful. And he promised he'd come and say bye before leaving back out for Madison. She said, he said he loved her and left her to meet up with friends. And she is heartbroken because in her heart, she know her son not okay. But she has to maintain hope while Jeffrey at his apartment eating what appeared to be Tony's body. I think that was his heart. I think he ate that boy's heart. And that right there, people, brought us to the end of episode six. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I will be back uh, live doing these reviews on Monday. I know that was a tough pill to swallow for you because he pulled for me as well. But that is episode six in its entirety. Again, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Have a beautiful and safe weekend. And I will see you guys back in the den on Monday.